Okay, thank you again for joining us. My name is Mary Angela Saavedra. I'm the director of the Center on the Hill, and we are so very pleased today to be joined by Thomas Hine, who is here to talk to us um, about uh, Populux Revisited, the look at life in modern mid-century America. So um, we're very excited to have him. I'd like to give you a little bit of a background on him. Thomas Hine is a writer on history, culture, and design. He was an architect and design critic of the Philadelphia Inquirer for 25 years and still reviews art exhibitions for the newspaper. He is the author of six books, among them The Rise and Fall of the American Teenager, The Total Package, and The Great Funk, Falling Apart and Coming Together on a Shag Rug in the 1970s. He was praised in The New Yorker by John Updike for his mischievously alert sensibility. He has also been a guest curator for several exhibitions, including Promises of Paradise, an examination of mid-century South Florida held at the Bass Museum in Miami Beach, 2007 to 2008. He was born in Boston, grew up in Connecticut, went to college at Yale, and has lived since 1970 in Center City, Philadelphia. We are so very pleased to be joined today by Thomas Hines. Welcome, Thomas. Well, thank you. Wherever, wherever we are, uh, this is, uh, this is a, a novel experience for me, so I hope the people will be uh, 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 patient, because I'm, I'm not used to giving a talk to, into a mirror sort of. Uh, I'll, mostly be, I'll mostly be showing you uh, pictures, uh, all of them very manipulative pictures, not always very uh, truthful pictures, but uh, often very seductive because, because the topic is, is, has to do with how our, our consumer culture was shaped during the period uh, specifically between 1954 and 1964, but basically for the two decades that followed World War II. Uh, you know, one thing that, uh, that last week when I was thinking about this lecture, I made perhaps the mistake of listening to a podcast uh, by a historian named Jason Stanley, who's a historian of fascism. And he, he said that all fascist movements depend on nostalgia, uh, the belief that uh, the belief in lost greatness. <coughs> and uh, uh, I I worry about this because nostalgia is 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 uh, uh, why so many people perhaps enjoy the book. It's probably it, of the things that I've done. It's the thing that people generally like the best. It has fallen out of fashion and out of print. Lately, partly I think because it did not deal sufficiently with with issues uh, such as uh, such as race, that uh, I had decided I was writing a visual analysis and didn't include that if I were doing it today, I would probably I would be I would probably do it very differently. But once I, I started thinking about about nostalgia and, and of course the the period that we're talking about is mostly is most often the period that people think that is when we were great. It's the, it's the, it's the America, make America great again. And it occurred to me that I, when I was working on this book in the mid 1980s, I actually had a, a, an anti-nostalgic uh, mission. I believe that uh, during the 1980s, uh, during the administration of, of President Reagan, uh, there was, the culture was beginning to define this period, these two decades after World War II, as normal, as what we should strive to be at all times. And there certainly were things about it, about the time that, that are extremely admirable, that uh, we had uh, a uh, probably greater income equality than we'd ever had, uh, than we've ever had in American history. We had uh, uh, a sense of solidarity that coming out of World War II, uh, very different from the from the what we have now. So there are things about about that period that one would like to return to, but you really have to understand that um, that this this was just an extraordinary. What I was really trying to say is that this is an extraordinary time. In a time in which the United States had really the world's only working economy for much of this period, and uh, a period in which uh, a lot of 
without having to get education, without having to get a great deal of training, people were able to move up the income level ladder very, very quickly. And uh, also, it was, a, it was an extraordinary time in another way in that we were worried about uh, being blown up by, by nuclear bombs. We were worried about Russia. We were deep in the Cold War. And even though so much of what I'm going to show you looks frivolous, the Cold War is really in the background. Uh, let me uh, uh, um, I'm just going to put this on. This is actually a piece of this is a piece of fabric from the period, and it gives it has a certain um, quality of the the visual quality of being of being abstract, of being a kind of floating, of being of airy, of of informality, sort of the suggestion of television, maybe in there too. That's it's uh, it's a uh, uh, it's just something that I want to talk. About. I'm, I'm going to use so that you don't have to look at my face while I talk about things like demographics and economics. The uh, uh, coming we 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 call this period the post-war era, but of course it was also the post-depression era. The war, the war convinced Americans that if they worked hard enough and if they worked together, they could achieve just about anything. But there was also a fear that once the wartime boom ended, uh, we would fall right back into depression. This is actually a recurrent fear. And so during, actually during World War II, right after, basically after the Battle of Midway in 1943, when it looked pretty clear that the war would be won, uh, there was a, a, a project, both in government and, biz and in business, to give a give a real jump start to the economy. There were a number of things that were done. For example, um, uh, there was a, a, a crash program to get television going, so that, that people would be able to there, that there would be a, a, a great new advertising medium that people would be responding to, and there was also the desire to build a tremendous amount of new housing. Now, partly that's because it was needed. If you look at a city like Philadelphia and the way people were living in their 30s and 40s with the overcrowding and with the, the lack of bathrooms and so forth, there was definitely a need for a housing upgrade. However, there was also another reason for, the, for this that essentially, the belief was that, that in order, if, if people were encouraged to get new houses, then they'd have to get new appliances, new furniture, new everything. They would be part of a new way of life. They would be uh, uh, renovation in the, in the cities was discouraged. Interracial neighborhoods were discouraged. The, the great subsidies were for uh, uh, VA mortgages and so forth were available to people who were buying out out in suburbia. So, so this was a it was a major social program. It was justified by some people uh, that it was a way to keep us less susceptible to the kind of aerial bombing campaigns that had happened during World War II, uh, but. But the real reason was to make people buy. Um, it, yeah. Now, yeah, I have I put this up as a as a kind of a an, an image of myself at the time, right? I was born in in two years after the war uh, the war ended in 1947, so it makes me an early uh, an early baby boomer. Uh, it's interesting how dominant the early baby boomers have been in our in our public life. Not always, not all of them for the better. We've had three presidents who were all born in the first year of the baby boom, 1946, and uh, and then two unsuccessful candidates who were born the year I was in 1947. Um, at any rate, uh, the uh, the Baby boom was something that was 
at first expected because people had been well one men were were missing during world war war ii uh many of them but even before that during the great depression people had deferred uh having having children the uh generation born during the great depression and world war ii was the smallest generation in American history since the Civil War. Uh, so uh, suddenly there was this, this onslaught of children that, that school sizes in the, in the town where I grew up, the, uh, uh, you know, the school, the, the, the size of the uh, class, high school classes, for example, you know, doubled just about every, every year uh, during the uh, the period that the that the first baby boomers were coming through, going from, yeah, as I as I say, I'm I'm getting up, I'm getting messed up in the math. It's not important, but uh, the, you know, so the the being able to to do things, to have things, and provide things for your children was obviously a very 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 important part of this. But I put this picture up also because I guess I was paying attention uh, that uh, that this this populux is in a weird way a kind of a, 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 a my life you know or at least an observation of things about about life when uh, when uh, in the period that we're talking about so uh, Barbie is uh, I suppose the epitome of 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 what I call this populux way of life in that, that she was defined entirely by her acquisitions. She was in, introduced in maybe the high watermark of the period, which is 19, 1959. Um, and of course, she's still, she's still very much with us today. The, uh, so as we, look at, as we look at these images, that it's, it's important to sort of think of the, of the novelty of of having this this dream of a, of having a swimming pool and, and and grilling and having you know having a uh, having this this kind of sense of in, informal luxury uh, that, that, that that was possible at the time. But of course, there was a lot of the you know I of, I often think the, I, of the uh, uh, excuse me. I think of the, uh, the, the famous uh, football quarterback Joe Namath. His biography was, "I can't wait until tomorrow because I get better looking every day." And there was this idea that uh, that uh, people, when polled, were, were, were looking forward to the future because everything was going to get better and better all the time. This is from a 1955 uh, newspaper supplement. And of course, some of these things are, are, part, of, are part of our lives, like giant-sized fruit, <laughs> um, ultrasonic laundry, not so much, a uh, phono vision receiver, we may actually be on one right now. Uh, and the, this idea of, of kind of openness of, of, the, of the, the personal helicopter was, was part of this idea of buying in, literally buying into a system of expansion uh, in order to keep the, in order to keep the economy uh, rolling. The, uh, here's another one that we seem to always be on the verge of, although nowadays we don't dream of self-driving cars as being, as, as being in, enabling the playing of dominoes. And, uh, and of course, space. This, um, this appeared in a, uh, 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 an interior decorating magazine. I think of it as a sort of a, a pre you know, we can have gay marriage maybe on the moon, right? Uh, but, okay, the two, there were two phases of this post-war era, okay? The, the first was roughly from 1945 until about 1953. And this was the period of people 
catching up on consumption. Uh, what we what we see here is the line uh, to see a model house at, in Levittown, Pennsylvania and Bucks County. Um, something we should note is that the blacks were not allowed to buy in Levittown, so there's no black faces in that line. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, but it was a, an opportunity for people in very overcrowded neighborhoods, especially in Philadelphia, to have, to have a house and people, people lined up to, to get the deal. And so what you have here is a rather minimal house. The average house that was being built in the 1940s was actually smaller than the houses that were being built in World War II. The difference was that many more of them were being built and many more people could afford them. Um, this is uh, the man in the center cutting the ribbon is William Levitt himself, the creator of the Levitt towns, the sort of mass produced uh, uh, suburbs. There's the, the, the moving van is idling in the background. There's the kid in, in that hat that, uh, that some of us remember. Uh, and the man that the man with the kind of odd looking man with the pipe is, is the mayor um, of what eventually became Willingboro. And this was in fact the first time that uh, Levittown was uh, racially integrated in, in, in Willingboro became the, the, uh, uh, a place where a lot of uh, black people uh, that had it, it developed a rather large black community. Now, uh, this is a this is sort of a, the street scene of Levittown, Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, Herbert Gans, the sociologist who, who with, at that time was at the University of Pennsylvania actually moved to Levittown and he recorded uh, uh, what was going on in his book, The Levittowners. And uh, he, what he found was a tremendous amount of this, the, not the euphoria that, that uh, the, some of the imagery makes you think about, but in fact, a great deal of anxiety. The people were coming out uh, here without the neighborhood ties, the family ties, they were living next door to people that were not, they didn't know, uh, you know they didn't know what they were like. He recounts a story of a woman being in, invited to a party and, and showing up and seeing through the window that the woman was wearing, the hostess was wearing capri pants and uh, the, 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 the guest decided not to attend the party. She decided it must be the wrong night because the, the hostess was in her pajamas. There was a lot of trying to figure out how, how does the society fit together? What, how, do, how, do we, how do we behave? And there was a critique, there was an intellectual critique of, the, of, of this kind of mass suburbia that was called, uh, there were books that called it disturbia, the split level trap, it was a, a place that was going to be a, uh, uh, that, that, that caused uh, madness and, and this depression and despair. Um, uh, though, uh, you know, obviously this was a time that, that, that people were very, the psychoanalysis had, had a moment at this, at this time. Uh, though uh, most of the people, uh, you know, seems to have got along, gotten along okay. Now, this is an aerial view of, of, of some suburban development in, in, in South Jersey. And it does, it does have a little bit of a sense of an infestation that you have kind of a normal landscape happening out at the edge. And then you have this, this imposition, this new place uh, and, and how, what is it, and how do you how do you live in it? As you know, for children, the the edges were, were what were interesting. You know, the place where, where the uh, where the you know, the sidewalk ends, and there were some some trees and uh, some other things. And then, of course, the reason for all of these houses was, as I said earlier, that you you had appliances, you had bigger refrigerators, you bought more things, you bought more packaged foods, you had you had a, 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 the, the supermarket arises in, in its full form at this point. So people are buying things 
and storing them for long periods of time. This is a kind of a, an icon of, of this, that the, the, the abundant refrigerators sort of became, uh, usually this one has a turkey in it. Most often there's a big pink ham in it. Uh, and I've talked to people from many other countries who said, who said that this was the thing that they most remember, they most uh, thought about, uh, about uh, what life was like in America. Of course, then we have the, the woman, the perfectly dressed woman in her high heels, you know, this sort of a, this uh, odd fantasy. How does, how does the woman, uh, the, what the so women ended up, were the ones who ended up in the suburbs full time, at least initially, and, and how do they, how do they navigate it? And, and of course, may, one way that they were encouraged to navigate it was through fantasy. So you have the, the mother with her, with her uh, uh, troublesome child over there. But why is she, why does she feel like she's a princess? Because her, her washing machine has a triple action agitator is what the uh, headline here says. I don't think we could say that today. And then, you know, the, the, the housewife in, in ecstasy is one of the, you know, really key tropes of visual culture in, in this, uh, this period. Why is this woman so wildly delighted? The answer is that she's the first person ever, so the caption says, to be cooking hamburgers with power from generated by a nuclear power plant, which you see directly behind her. So the, the caption was <laughs> Adam burgers coming right up. Of course, well, now we talk about nuclear power and about domesticity, we're back to the Cold War. This is the famous uh, kitchen debate um, in, in Moscow. You'd see that there was a, a, a model kitchen uh, set up in a, in, a, uh, in, a, it was in a geodesic dome actually in Moscow. And uh, it was toured by you see uh, Nikita Khrushchev, who was the uh, premier of Russia, or the, or the Soviet Union, I should say, on the left. And this, you see Richard Nixon, the then vice president of the United States. And then right behind him is Khrushchev's six, eventual successor, Leonid Brezhnev. Um, and what Khrushchev is supposed to be saying to, you know, what Nixon has, had said was that this is, the, this is how we, America beats you because everyone has this opportunity to have an automatic washing machine. And Khrushchev started saying things like, ah, it doesn't work. It's going to break. The moment it breaks, nobody will ever be able to fix it. And, uh, but they, but I think that both uh, Khrushchev and Nixon got a good deal of mileage out of their, this po their pose as a, uh, debating the uh, the merits of American consumerism, and the message that was sent here is that it's the it's the suburban housewife in her kitchen with her with all of her products that was going in a way to win the Cold War. Uh, we were looking always looking at the toward, toward the future, but in a weird way with a very little social imagination. This is. You, the, the Jetsons, a, the television series, though this comes from a comic strip, that basically uh, it was supposed to happen 500 years or so later, but it, it, it completely uh, uh, replicated the social situation and the expectations that people had um, during that period. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and to talk about to concentrate more on the visual qualities of the uh, of the period to, uh, that because uh, that's you know, uh, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> the this is is a, a wonderful picture of uh, Charles Ames and and his wife Ray 
uh, standing in the superstructure of their house that they built in 1949 in Pacific Palisade, California. He was, of course, a, a great designer that we all know about Eames chairs and so forth. And his, she was his she was his very close collaborator. The story, the story goes that they designed a house. In fact, it's, it's true. He designed, they designed a house um, that was very different. And they ordered the steel and the, 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 the trusses and so forth to build the house. And they, then they decided once it was all there that they wanted a different house. They built a different house. And there's this sense of imagination and, and freedom that kind of anything is possible. We can just take this car and, uh, and, and this, this kit of parts, I should say, and achieve, achieve just about anything. If I say that, I, I don't have pictures. I, I'm not going to show you pictures of the house as it was, as it was finished. I, uh, Ray once ha had me for lunch in that house, which is one of the great experiences of, of my life. Okay, this idea that the, the Ames house was one of the earliest uh, of the case study, what were called the case study houses of the greater Los Angeles area. And it was Southern California that was providing the model for the rest of the country. Uh, this house is a later house. This is built in 1958, and uh, the, the photograph was taken by the by the great photographer Julius Shulman, who uh, essentially, uh, in in a way, created the, the mid century modern style with the way that he photographed the police ha the houses. Uh, this, uh, as he he once told me was was a, this particular photograph, maybe his most famous, is a kind of a fake in that he actually uh, showed up with a, uh, a, a moving van uh, or a truck full of furniture because the people who lived in the house like heavy old, the whole, what he called old English furniture. And so the, the didn't look, it didn't look good in the house at all. And so he moved in much more modern pieces so that there would be, they would get this sense of transparency and airing, airiness. Interestingly, the people who bought this house in 1958 lived in it for more than 50 years. And in their later years, they supported themselves by renting it out for photo shoots and, and movies because so many people are just fell in love with this image, this dream of the house. Okay, a long way from Levittown, but it's a, it's, it's a sort of an aspiration. Uh, Shulman later went back to some of the houses he photographed in black and white in the 50s and redid them in the, it redid them in the, uh, in the 90s in color. Uh, and uh, that's, that's this is one. So, you know, you have, uh, my, modernity is, is only kind of one one part of the picture. Uh, of course, you have uh, uh, tradition and modernity uh, mixing. So this was an era of the colonial house as well, of the ranch house, which had which was essentially modern, but which had a kind of uh, historical uh, aura to it. Uh, the, the chair in which this man is sitting is, is uh, uh, Ira, Sar Ira Saarinen's womb chair, which was uh, made by, may actually made in Montgomery County by Noel. Uh, it was, it's kind of one of the iconic chairs of the period. And so he's, he's in there uh, kind of hiding from having to go to church. I put this in because this is the Presbyterian church and I figured that that I, I should should do that. Also, the Sunday paper, which I have a uh, uh, have an affinity to. And then, oh, here's another. Uh, this is a local house of worship that really did, uh, you know, embrace modernism. This is the uh, Beth Shalom uh, synagogue in in Elkins Park that was uh, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright and opened in 1959. Now. So the, this idea of a kind of an integrated, simplified modernism uh, 
I'm going to talk a lot about cars. Uh, so, uh, the simplified modernism of of the uh, of the immediate post-war era really was was exemplified in this uh, this coupe, the Studebaker coupe designed by Raymond Lowry. You know, maybe the most maybe the most beautiful American car, uh, mass production car. Well, it was not. It was, it was actually not that many uh, ever built. It, it it really you know could have been kind of a model for the future, but unfortunately, it uh, it was introduced in 1953, the same year that the Cadillac uh, developed breasts. Yeah. Or uh, these things, the, these things on the front, they were they were called Dagmars because there was a woman on t late night TV uh, who had big breasts. They were also called bombs for for obvious reasons, but they were part of a of a of slightly different aesthetic, and which which is what I end up calling populux as opposed to modernism because what it is is it's a design of added elements of, of what car designers uh, uh, called GORP, which I asked what GORP is, and it's, they said, well, it's like the stuff you have on a hot fudge sundae, the, the people, it's trail mix. So GORP is, a, um, is, just, is just sweet, sweet stuff that, that, gets, uh, that gets added to a kind of a standardized product. So in other words, you're not starting from scratch and trying to, to make a, a new shape or a better shape, you're, uh, you say you're getting uh, uh, your value from the things that you add to it. Uh, Harley Earl, who was the chief designer of, uh, uh, for uh, General Motors, uh, was asked what was the point of a tail fan. And he said that the, the tail fin was was a, a visible receipt for having bought an expensive car. Uh, later, Chrysler uh, Corporation argued that the tail fin, what the tail fin provided, was stability at speed, which is a nice summation of what people seemed to be looking for during the period of the fifties and the early sixties. Um, this is California dip. I, uh, it's a kind of a Populux product because it's sort of, uh, it, it has some of the wavy uh, 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 look of the, uh, you know, of the architecture. You in fact even have, you have the corrugated chips and then you have, you know, you have, it's, it's a product that's designed, was designed to, uh, uh, encouraged the sale of powdered onion soup. It also encouraged the sale of, uh, uh, of, of sour cream. And it, uh, it meant that you could be ready at a moment's notice. It was, a, it was a, an icon in, of informality. Uh, you know, rhyming with, with something like this, the butterfly chair, uh, which has a similar form, a similar uh, swooping, bending form. This was a chair that uh, started out being a kind of a luxury product, a luxury design made of leather. But by the time of the, by the, by the 1950s, you could buy these for six and seven dollars. And uh, they didn't always last very long and um, uh, not all that easy to get out of. Now, going back to the tail fin for a moment, Earl, who was, I said, uh, Harley Earl, who, in, who invented the tail fan, uh, uh, said that he got the idea for the tail fan that this would this would be where where the where automobile design would be going when he saw this airplane uh, during during World War II when he was trying to find a way to give a form to uh, a luxury to post-war product. The tail fin appeared first on the Cadillac, and then it gradually moved down the product line to to 
less and less expensive cars, and soon everybody could could have a tail fin. The uh, but I, I also bring this up to just kind of reinforce the military uh, connection of, of uh, the, the war, the war being recent, but the war also being ongoing. The, 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 uh, uh, that the innovation of the war, but the fear, uh, the fear of the Soviet Union, and 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 uh, all that. Uh, the that's Chuck. That's the famous Chuck Yeager, the, the guy who had the right stuff in, in Tom Wolfe's uh, book. Uh, he's in 1947. He broke the. He broke. He was the first person in that miss in this plane. He broke the sound barrier, and you can see in this plane some of the visual qualities of the that that would characterize the, the period after you know from the mid from the early 50s on. Where you went from rounded forms that had been uh, inspired by trains and ocean liners and so forth to more acute angles to uh, uh, to things that had a kind of a bullet had an angle uh, you know more of a, just kind of a, a bullet quality to them and the visual of uh, you know. Of breaking the sound barrier was very important too. That the idea that you you were you were making this kind of V-shaped wave wave in the sky, uh, very you know. So you it's not go. You don't have to go very far from from this airplane to this uh, car, which was just a show car. It was never produced. The the the, 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 the Firebird. Also, also designed by Harold um, yeah, taking its direct inspiration from the from the vehicle that, that broke the sound barrier. Uh, now, we're I I, I want to draw your attention to the left and and to the to the logo on the side of the car, which was the Chrysler Corporation logo. That's a a Plymouth, and the their uh, uh, I guess in 1956, uh, their slogan was the new shape of motion, and what that really had to do with was the was was the, the way that the jet age was was inspiring uh, everything else. There were also you know there were jet age uh, jet looking. Ballpoint, well, ballpoint pen was a new thing, and it came in new car colors and and had uh, jet-like uh, logos and so forth on it. So you have this this kind of very sexy and fast uh, 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 look about things. But it, but again, with the with the, the yeah, military uh, uh, very strong military connection. Uh, here is a you know. Uh, sort of the, the the tail fin developed, and this is a you know this is a, a gore, actually a very pretty car I think, but but you see that it, there's a lot of what it has is about overlay and about 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 things things added rather than the kind of pure, purity of form. I just why why I wanted to put this in why like I mentioned uh, Era Siren and earlier. This is um, uh, the General Motors Technical Center, which is where this car was designed. So if you went to, uh, if you if you uh, were went to visit the designer of this car, this is the receptionist you would uh, you would you would meet on your way in. Uh, really, kind of a, a model for James Bond a little bit later. And then here we have by 1959, uh, we have one of, I love the, the headline, and one of the most extreme cars ever, ever created. And what's what's notable about this, A, is that the, the, the house is, is modernist. The people are seemingly rather upscale, but the car is actually a you know, a Plymouth. It was the lowest 
prestigious car uh, in the uh, uh, of, at the of the time, uh, but it what it was showing is that you add all of these extra touches, these, these this gorp upon gorp upon gorp, and even the people who were were buying the lowest of the low price three, as they were known, um, uh, it was uh, uh, they could could still uh, come up with this kind of ridiculously extravagant uh, over the top car and feel that they were also uh, somehow had good taste. Not every, you know, Populous didn't always work. I have to point this out. This is this is 1958. This is the Edsel. Uh, probably the most famous failure in the history of the American automobile industry. Uh, it, uh, it, was, it was described as an Oldsmobile sucking a lemon uh, or as a lemon. Uh, and uh, it, uh, yeah, but I guess all I'm saying is that not every sales pitch works. I, that, the, that this was, that the introduction of the Edsel was one of the was one of the biggest marketing campaigns in, in American history, and it, uh, it it disappeared after two years. And then you know this same idea of of decorate decor make every surface different, make every uh, uh, you know add. Uh, Kind of expensive looking things like this doorknob and this and 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 having having things swoop uh, uh, this was a this uh, house appeared in a do-it-yourself builders magazine you could send away and get plans and build this house uh, yourself uh, I don't know anybody who did um, this is a Side this, uh, this is the uh, Willow Grove bowling alley, in Willow Grove, Pennsylvania, which was certainly a Populux uh, idea. Basically, it was just a it was just a box with this swoopy thing out the front of it, uh, but the, to make it to make it modern and, and exciting and and you know uh, bowling. Uh, you know, was a very mechanized uh, and, and much more much marketed uh, form of recreation. Okay, I this is this this feels this feels abrupt, but I've I've come to. The, I uh, uh, what what ended Populux is a question that I often get asked. And I decided I was not going to subject you to any photographs of the Kennedy assassination. Certainly, that was a, a moment that uh, sort of really put an end, an end point to this uh, kind of end, endless optimism, endless, uh, endless uh, idealism and looking to the self, looking to the future. Uh, that they really put people in a moment of doubt, you know, a moment maybe like we're li we're living through right now. But I think, in a weird way, the thing that really ended the Populux era was uh, the arrival of the rest of the world. That America was no longer providing popular culture to the entire world. We no longer were the the world's most uh, world only really functioning economy. And when the Beatles came to America, here they are in Miami Beach, seemingly uh, at the mercy of some predatory young American girls. Uh, uh, that that really kind of was a punctuation mark. It uh, it said it said. Uh, Americans are, are are part of the world. They look outside of the uh, outside of the country and look at look at products and entertainment and and so forth. And we're no longer, uh, you know, we're no longer are on our own by our by ourselves. We're we uh, we're we're part of a larger.
larger part of a larger whole. And in uh, the Beatles were wonderful, and and the you know and and experiencing the world was wonderful. But it was the end of this of this particular moment, which was something to see, but we never need to go back to. I, I'll, I'll end here and anyone who has questions, so feel free. Great, thank you so much. Um, everyone, you can unmute yourselves if you've got some questions. Um, I have just a, a question um, to kind of get us started, but um, I found it very interesting that, you know, as, as you talked about sort of the look of things. And so this period really had had a look like, you know, the from all the way from Levittown and the way the houses looked and the cars and everything. And so is that really the defining, like like what what would you say is is the real defining piece of of this this era? Like, is it is it the look of it? Is it the the feel? The you know how we were living? What what exactly? Well, I guess what I do is look at things. That's what I do. That's sort of what I do for a living. <laughs> and it it's one way to uh, to to think about it, and and uh, and it's it's a way that that. For me, because the, this the combination of the look and also the kind of manipulativeness of the imagery, uh, kind of uh, I think I was hoping to evoke uh, a sense of of how it felt, but also of a kind of unreality of that it's it's promotional, uh, uh, but also fun, you know. It, 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 and uh, the it it off it seems you know one of the reasons why we might be nostalgic for it is that it seems to have so many possibilities. I I notice a lot of pictures. I have my family has a lot of um, photos from from that time. You know, everybody was taking pictures and home movies of, and I find it so interesting how a lot of my family photos really mirror some of the images. You showed like like my grandmother was staging things like this is this is how you know we need to have these things and this needs to look this way to fit in this which is why I was I was curious that's it's really fascinating. Well, I mean, you know, people always want to know whether I grew up in this kind of populux house populux environment, and it's exactly the exactly the opposite. I grew up in a kind of ramshackle house that was built in 1770, and maybe uh had 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 no closets and and low ceilings and uh, uh a basement that was didn't even have mortar between its stones it was just one stone on on top of the other as a result we had a lot of visitors from around uh animals and such and snakes uh you know so maybe that's sort of my some of my fascination with this kind of smooth and futuristic stuff comes from the fact that I lo I loved that house in, in its way but it was not I I did not grow up in a populux uh, uh, uh I did not grow up up in a popular populux house although at one point our family did have a a white Buick convertible with blue leather upholstery and a mysterious bullet hole in the side. Uh, <laughs> we bought it you. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, I would hope so. <laughs> Great, are there other questions, feedback? You can, again, unmute yourself, turn your cameras on, ask some questions. Oh, I want, uh, this is James Chen. I want to uh, uh, say one thing to Tom, which is the, I guess, I'm only guessing, but I believe I'm correct even by about 1980, 1985, about your not mentioning African-Americans or minorities or other ethnic groups, because it was still very much the 80s, early 80s, forget just the ethos, but just, just skin color. It was pretty white. It was, you know, so when you, when you were writing a book, you write about what is considered uh, quite normal uh, in the sense that I guess I have to put it very bluntly that structural racism was totally 
accepted, admitted, and considered very normal. So, so, and then of course well, on a very yeah, that's, uh, what, Nordic, that's what makes it systemic. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, <laughs> and, and also also this is this is a flip uh, a naughty comment too. Yes, you might have missed the African Americans, but you also missed Doris Day. How dare <laughs> you miss Doris Day? Just as bad. <laughs> you know that. No, I actually. <laughs> That's a great, you know that James knows that uh, I, the New York Times gave me a wonderful review of this book, but uh, castigated me for having missed Doris Day. Doris Day. <laughs> yeah. No, but uh, it's, no, I, there were a few, there are a few paragraphs in the book which I deal with issues of the civil rights movement and of, of racism, but I viewed that as a as a different subject. I'm I'm writing. I was writing a book about kind of the, uh, you know, the the development, the visual development of the suburban lifestyle in this in this period of time, and I point out in the book uh, that uh, that the law uh, and it literally the federal law uh, discouraged. Uh, uh, integrated neighborhoods. It discouraged any renovation of, of, uh, of city neighborhoods. And so it, it really did uh, help create a, 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 a single, you know, a one, an all white world in the suburbs. So. I, was, I was Googling as you are talking and I found that 83% of America was white in 1980 Whereas in 2010, it's only 72%. So that's a big drop. You know, no wonder. No wonder. Yeah. And of course, during the period that I'm talking about, uh, you know, leaving aside, leaving aside the, the Black population, there was essentially no immigration between uh, 1924 and uh, about 1965. It was very, very difficult to immigrate unless you were from a country that there had already was already well represented in the U.S. population, which meant Europeans. So uh, there was it, it. It was very, and that's of course, arguably contributes to the greater solidarity of the society that that we that people thought at least that that. Uh, that Americans were all were all the same, and that, that we were all in it together, rather than being competing interest groups. Are there some other questions? I saw um, a couple of people turn on their cameras. Are there other questions or comments, feedback? <laughs> okay. Well, um, if we don't have any other questions, I want to just thank you so much, um, Thomas, for, for being with us. And um, are yearbooks sort of. <laughs> of, available on Amazon? Like, can I find them at my pop Well, on, pop as colors? I said, the Populux keeps, uh, well, my other books are, e are in print and are, are, are several of my other books are in print and easier to find. Populux uh, has come out in five different editions over the years, uh, but we seem to be in a period of uh, out of print. And so you, you know, I just looked I just checked Amazon uh, before I came on, and they're they're charging very very large sums of money for uh, for the for the copies that are left. If you can get, I mean, the the, the best one is to get is the original 1986 um, uh, uh, Knopf edition that had the beautiful end papers. Or, uh, but then the the more recent the more recent one uh, oh. is. Uh, this was in print until very recently. This is Overlook Press, uh, and it came out about 2008. But it, they seem to have basically sold everything that they that they printed, and they're not they're not printing more. Okay, we did get a message for you in the chat. Um, it says, "Thank you. I read your book and loved it. Enjoyed this refresher very much." And that came from Mary Collins. So, popped up in the chat. <laughs> 
All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you again, Thomas, for being with us. We really appreciate it. It was wonderful having you. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thanks for being with us. Take care. Bye.